Good morning. My name is Holly. I'm a program manager at Edison Ford Winter Estates. I'm going to talk today about Harriet Tubman. I learned a lot about her. What an amazing woman. This is a statue of Harriet Tubman in front of the CIA building in D.C. Because of her work, they considered some espionage spy work. They honored her with um, the statue. There are a lot of statues in different places across the country. And uh, I'll tell you a little more about that once we get our webinar started. So let's get going. It's Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad, and her Florida legacy, because she was here in Florida. And thank you all for your support and joining me every month. I appreciate it. Uh, just to give you an idea of where she's born, she was born enslaved in March 1822 on a farm owned by Anthony Thompson of Eastern Shore of Maryland and Dorchester County. And you can see where this is located on the map of Maryland. Uh, one thing I've discovered when in researching Harriet Tubman, there are not a lot of absolutes. Even the year she was born is not absolute. Uh, she reported she was born in 1825. Her death certificate says 1815. Her gravestone says 1820. And Kate Larson, who did a biography, which I, I did use in this research of Tubman, records it as 1822. And that was based on a payment to a midwife and some other documents, including uh, the when she was a runaway uh, as a slave and they posted a reward and her date of birth was put there. Her mother was enslaved by Mary Pattison Brodus and later her son, Edward, and her father was enslaved by Anthony Thompson, who became Mary Broda's second husband. And Harriet was the fifth of nine children. Her parents, Benjamin, Ben, and Harriet Ritt, Green Ross named her Armamenta Ross. Her parents called her Minty. Now her father will eventually be free, but you'll find out that that doesn't happen for her mother right away. I don't wanna to forget to tell you about that. Harriet had eight slave siblings, two who were sold in the 1830s by Edward Brodus. And then later on, she remembers seeing two of her siblings sold. Well, I'm saying two, but there's also instances where there's three recorded and the ones that were sold earlier are not listed. I didn't come up with an absolute, but we know during Harriet's lifetime, either two or three of her siblings were um, sold to another um, enslaver. her. And at about the age of five, she was rented out. Age of five, when a child should be attending kindergarten as a nursemaid and, a, and later on as a field hand and a cook and a woodcutter. And she much preferred, if not preferred the work, but she would have rather been working outside than inside. That's the type of person she was. And that will be helpful later on when she's bringing people to freedom. Uh, her, Tubman speaks about her own appearance, and she said her hair stood out like a bushel basket, which is not disparaging her image. This is why it was a good thing for her. It was thick and never combed, and so when she was 12, she, she says it helped save her life. Her owner had sent her to a local dry goods store known as the Bucktown General Store, and it still exists today in Maryland. So she wrapped her head in a shawl, uh, just to keep it under cover. And while she was doing that, an enslaved boy was chased inside by his owner. And this is a very small store. And so you're kind of trapped once you're in there. And the overseer that was trying to chase this uh, enslaved boy yelled at Tubman to get, grab him. And she didn't, of course, because she's enslaved and she is not going to help someone else keep someone else enslaved. Only seconds passed when the boy ran off but the overseer of the enslaved boy picked up a two pound weight, if you can imagine, threw it at the boy, but he missed. He hit Harriet and she said it broke her skull. It cut her scar, um, part of her shawl off and it drove it into her head. She was taken back to slave quarters. I think she said um, she was laid down and just neglected completely. She received no medical attention. She said it broke her skull and part of the shawl drove it into her head. She's unconscious and for several days, uh, that's how she exists. And she had a brain injury and it causes seizures, sleeping spells. And it people, she said that she 
she had a faith in God, but this deepened her faith. And she said that she got messages from God premonitions and she dreamed of escaping slavery. And she dealt with this from the rest of her life, but she also deepened her feelings towards God, which was a mixture of probably several um, Catholic and it was Catholic and Protestant, uh, just a bunch of different things. But she always believed she was representing God and led by God. Now, there are other versions of this story that will say, you know, she, she, it was her owner that hit her. Uh, it keeps on changing, but this was the most accurate and the consistent one and the most historically researched I could find. Now, around 1844, she named a free, free black man named John Tubman and took his last name. Remember, her name was Araminta Ross, and she changed it to Harriet after her mother, we believe. Um, and of course, she marries Tubman. And actually, we don't know exactly when she changed her name or why. And her marriage to John was complicated. It, he is also a free Black, just like her father becomes a free Black. And in 1849, Tubman became ill again, which reduced her value to slave traders. Edward Brodus the son of her previous enslaver, attempted to sell her, but he couldn't find a buyer. His death, and when he died, increased the chances that Tubman would be sold because his widow, Eliza, was having financial problems. She was going to lose her home. So she began to sell the family's enslaved people. And Harriet decided to refuse to let the Brodus family decide her fate. Despite her husband's efforts to discourage her, she said later years, there's two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. And we'll talk about that quote again. So at this point, I just want you to think about this. Her father is now free. Her mother is still enslaved, as are her siblings. But actually, at one point, Harriet, I'll just mention this now so I won't forget, actually went back and discovered that her mother should have been freed by the person that enslaved her 15 years sooner, according to the terms of that parent's will, and it never happened. So it was very delayed in happening that her mother was free. So Tubman and her brothers, Ben and Henry, escaped from slavery on September 17, 1849. Tubman had been rented out again, as though she were a piece of furniture to Anthony Thomas, the son of her father's for, former owner. I, I just It's just appalling to me to realize not that far lo long ago in our history, people were leased out and they were enslaved. Because, the, because they were leased out, Eliza Brodus probably didn't realize for a while. Remember, that's the person that's going to sell her off that they were absent and there was an escape attempt. So even though she was their enslaver, she could rent them out to other people. So eventually it was discovered. And two weeks later, Eliza posted a runaway notice in the Cambridge Democrat offering a reward up to US $100 each at the time, about 4,100 today for their capture and return. Once they left, Tubman's brothers had second thoughts. What would happen to them? So the men returned, causing Tubman to return too. So she had to go back. So here's a clipping from that paper. And it says $300 reward. Run away from the subscriber on Monday the 17th. Three Negroes are as follows. Harry, age 19. Minty, age 27. And Ben was about 25 years old. And she posted this in the paper for their return. So imagine what it was like for Harriet. She had escaped and then her brothers were understandably afraid. And so they all went back. Would she get another chance? And this is up here. I, I mentioned later, Harriet does get married to this gentleman here. And I think that's the only picture in existence of them. 
Now, when Harriet escaped again, she traveled alone, so her husband did not come with her. Harriet Tubman traveled at night so that she would not be seen by slave catchers. She truly did follow the North Star as her guide. The first person to help her was a Quaker who gave her shelter the first night and instruction on what to do. And this woman was part of the Underground Railroad Network that provided shelter and transportation. It was an informal system that was made up of free and enslaved blacks, white abolitionists and other activists that didn't agree with slavery, enslaving people. The most common route for people fleeing slavery was northeast along the Choptank River through Delaware and then north into Pennsylvania, a journey of almost 90 miles. It usually is rounded up, rounded up to 100 miles. And on foot, that would have taken between five days. I think it would have been a little longer than that and three weeks because they're walking at night. They're trying to avoid capture and they're trying to keep secret where they are going from place to place. Now, the details of this journey aren't known because other escapees use the routes and Tedman did not discuss them until many years later. So we don't know everything she experienced, but she did recall the experience of entering Pennsylvania years later. When I crossed that line, I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person. There was such a glory over everything. The sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, I felt like I was in heaven because for the first time in her life, at least in those Northern states, she was free. And this is taken from the motion picture, Harriet, because there's very limited pictures. The first one that exists was taken when she was in her forties. So Harriet will return between 1850 and 1860. She led somewhere between 11 and 13 times she returns, approximately 70 family members and others enslaved to freedom. She made her first trip back in 1850 when she discovered that her niece, Kezia, was going to be auctioned off along with her two children. First, she made a plan with Kezia's husband, a free man, and Harriet Lutz the skills she was learning while observing the stars and making her way in the field to guide people to freedom. Now, so she came back so that other people would not be enslaved. She made her last trip to Maryland in 1860. When Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, this allowed authorities in non-slave states, so you could be in a free state like Massachusetts or New Hampshire, and you, if you saw somebody that you believed had been enslaved, you could return them to their owner, even though they were in a free state. Tubman helped, and when this happens, she reroutes the Underground Railroad to Canada in Ontario, and she actually lives there for a while with some of her family members. Tubman, or Moses as she was called, traveled by night in an extreme secrecy and said she never lost a passenger. Now, the person that writes Harriet Tubman biography, oh, I don't know, a few years after um, she was done through the Civil War and she was very poor. This woman uh, wrote her biography, but Harriet did great work and she was one of the leaders on the Underground Railroad, but, she, but it was about 70 people, uh, more or less. This biographer said, 300 people. That's the tricky part that I told you about. Everything keeps on um, changing. Sometimes you exaggerate. Sometimes the stories change. But no matter what, we know that she was a shero, a hero for her of her people and a very brave leader of the abolitionist movement, the Underground Railroad. And she was friends with many of the leading abolitionists um, during that time period, such as Frances Seward, who was the wife of the Secretary of State, I believe he was. Um, he had also been a senator. Uh, Frederick Douglass, John Brown, and she had some association, and William Lloyd Douglas. And a lot of people think of her as this, you see in that picture of her as a, a couple of years before she passed, as just a sweet lady. Not everybody always agreed with all her methods. She was a tough woman who was willing to do whatever it took on the Underground Railroad to get people to freedom. 
1857, two groups of enslaved people escaped from the Cambridge, Maryland area. Tubman did not guide them, but aided by providing detailed instructions. 54 men, women, and children escaped and what the press described, and that's that uh, clipping, as a great stampede. No less than 30 made their escape. And then there's list the reward. And sh 54 men, they say here 44. So you can see the numbers are very, it does say 44 total there. She gave instructions to other enslaved who found their way to freedom. So even when she wasn't leading them, she was assisting others. One thing I will say that is her last sister, she wanted to free her and she got back and she had already been sold and moved. And so she could not rescue that last sister, which was heartbreaking to her. But what she did do was rescue another group of people and bring them back up north. And eventually, many years later, she is able to get to her mother and tell her that she was free and she will move her family. At that point, because of that fugitive slave law, she moves them to Ontario, Canada. I just want you to know Harriet's view on things. Slavery is the next thing to hell. And I don't feel like if anybody has never been enslaved, we don't have a right to contradict that. I think that is about as truthful as a statement as you could find. Um, this is interesting to me. Uh, um, I don't know if you remember, but a few years ago, it came out that quite a few years ago, probably between the 80s and 90s, they said that um, quilt codes were used and many people used them to escape from being enslaved. Now, I can't say 100% that that's not true, but Harriet never used it. And there is some, there hasn't been a lot of evidence uh, showing that the enslaved use quilts. There, as with everything, it's probably, uh, there's some, that, some out there, but not as many. And some people believe it didn't exist as all. all. And this is from uh, Kate Larson's book, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero, Proud for the promised land. She also has a web page that said she didn't use the quilt code if, and she doesn't believe it existed. Harriet used the stars and other methods and paths to escape slavery and to go back and rescue others. She relied on trustworthy people, black and white, who hit her, told her which way to go and told her who she could trust. She used disguises. She walked. She rode horses and wagons. She sailed on boats and rolled on trains. And she even used certain songs to indicate danger or safety. And she would sing, um, Go Down Moses, as one is one of her songs. And other one is about the river. And it just escaped my um, recollection. And even the way she sang them, the pace of the way she sang them, how loud she sang them, um, she would use those to indicate danger or safety. She used letters written for her by someone else because Harriet Tubman is illiterate to, tr to trusted individuals like Jacob Jackson, who was a great friend of hers and worked on the Underground Railroad. And she used direct communication by speaking with people. She used the stars and she used other natural phenomenon to lead her north. And she trusted her instincts. And as I told you, she had an overwhelming faith in God to guide and comfort her th through difficult and unfamiliar territory. Um, Jacob Jackson was a free black farmer and a veterinarian, veterinarian, and he was also Harriet Tubman's confidant. And he had written, she had a coded red letter written to him for her in Philadelphia to send to Jackson in December of 1854, telling him to tell her brothers that she was coming to rescue them and that they needed to be ready to step aboard the old ship of Zion. That's, that's the flight to freedom. There's no documentation that Jackson actually sh sheltered runaways in his home, but he referred to as an agent. So he assisted people along their way. They were agents and they were people that sheltered people. And this will come up again, but she Harriet carried a small pistol with her on her rescue missions. And this was what I said, she had to be very tough, mostly for protection from slave catchers, but she also encouraged weak-hearted runaways from turning back and risking the safety of the group. 
And she did say that she would shoot them if they attempted to flee because she would have put everyone else, would have put everyone else in danger. And so do I believe that that would happen? Yes, I do, because she took the, she believed she was being led by God and it was her mission to get people to safety. And one person destroying that for everyone else, she would not tolerate. I um, mean, she also carried a sharpshooter rifle during the Civil War. And I'll talk to you about her Civil War connection if you're not familiar with it. And here's the two songs. Uh, well, there they are. Go Down Moses. And the other one was Bound for the Promised Land. Excuse me. I was thinking it was about a river. And Harriet said she changed the tempo to, of the songs to indicate whether it was safe to come out or not. And I've read that she did other things to the songs, like how loud they sang them as well. I would recommend this book. For many years, just that biography that was written shortly after uh, Harriet Tubman was in the Civil War, I uh, was out there and there were some things that were a little condescending and mis misrepresented. I mean, there's definitely some truth in it. And then it was rewritten. And then for many years, the only book about Harriet Tubman was those were all about written for children. But in 2003 and then there were two in 2004 books that came out. And then there was a book about her written which has a lot of pictures and it had in 2019 called she saved it came to slave but slay but there was no um references or bibliography or anything like that so i wasn't sure of all the information that was in it if it was correct but hopefully i mean it's been almost 20 years since something that came out and history is very fluid because you're always uncovering new information um, there's things about Harriet Tubman everywhere. This is in Cambridge, Maryland. Remember, she's from the Eastern Shore. This is Harriet Tubman Museum and Educational Center. And there's a mural of Harriet reaching out her hand to help people into freedom. Uh, there was a picture in the paper of a young little girl there reaching out her hand to Harriet as well. Interesting story here. On April 27th in Troy, New York in 1860, Harriet Tubman helped rescue Charles, Charles Nally, a fugitive from slavery. He had escaped from Virginia, traveled via the Underground Railroad. And because of that, his brothers were sold, never heard of again. And Charles wanting to reconnect with his wife and children who were free up north, stopped in Albany and later in Troy. And while he was there, he was grabbed by a federal marshal. And while he was in the second floor of a building, Harriet Tubman, who was just a coincidence visiting Troy that day, heard about what was happening and she rushed to help him. She disguised herself as an old woman. She reached Nally and signaled him to exit through the window. A large crowd gathered below and a great commotion ensued. And Charles was brought out of the window and taken across the river to water Valite. This is in the Albany area and he was rearrested. And then Tubman and a crowd of African-Americans and whites together crossed the river, surrounded the building where he was being hold, held for the second time and through gunfire, through gunfire, freed him. And this is a woodcut of Harriet during her Civil War time. I've heard her 18, 1861. Uh, she did go briefly down South and then returned. But I'm thinking this is the date of 1865 might be more in line after she served, after she was carrying this rifle. Um, and anyway, they did free him. So she had volunteered for duty after the, shortly after the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861, offering her sin, sin, assistance to Brigadier General Benjamin Butler, who is not always beloved by all people in the Union at Fort Monroe in Virginia. As enslaved people sought sanctuary at the garrison there, Tubman provided humanitarian aid as a cook, a laundress, and a nurse. And then she spends the winter of 1861 and 1862 in Boston, Massachusetts. And the governor there, John Andrew, was an abolitionist as well. And he has troops heading to South Carolina. So he is going to recruit her to perform her humanitarian work in Port Royal, South Carolina. And if you've read about the Civil War, a lot of these names uh, are familiar to you. And Her a Tubman traveled to South Carolina where she helped, she ran a warehouse where she helped teach newly freed women some skills such as baking, washing laundry, et cetera. Um, they didn't have that background. 
And there she met up with Davy Hunter, a union general who was very much into abolition. And he, he declared all the contrabands, and he means enslaved people that don't know they're free, that they were free. Um, now, something that was interesting that was that Lincoln reprimands him because even when he does the Emancipation Proclamation, he does not make the enslaved in the South free. That is reserved for the enslaved, and I mean, those who are free that were enslaved and made their ways to freedom in the North. And Lincoln was not yet ready to do that. And Harriet Tubman condemned him for that. She was very disappointed that he wasn't willing to end slavery at that time. Now, you know, eventually that he will do so. Well, Tubman later served as a nurse in Port Royal and she um, created remedies. She had a, quite a knowledge of herbal uh, remedies for medicine and healing and aided soldiers suffering from dysentery and infections diseases. Now in South Carolina, Tubman's gonna meet Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higgison, assembling the first South Carolina volunteers, the first federally authorized black regiment in the United States Army. The first South Carolina was made up of the formerly enslaved from South Carolina and Florida, with 300 recruits arriving from Fernandina, which is on Amelia Island, Fernandina Beach, and St. Augustine. North, North Florida towns that remained under Union control from eight, March 1862, and Tubman went to work with them. And that's from that article in the Jacksonville Magazine, Jacksonville Story. Okay, now... Colonel Higginson's going to think of one way about freedom and Colonel Montgomery another way. A few months later, they're going to be joined by Colonel James Montgomery in the second South Carolina. They too were comprised of former enslaved, many whom Montgomery had recruited at Key West. And he is an abolitionist and not just a regular, he is an ardent abolitionist and he is willing to use guerrilla warfare if necessary. Both abolitionists knew Tubman prior to the war and suggested creating a spy network in that area. And this is the first South Carolina in that area. I'm sorry, it's so blurry. But after January 1st, 1863, Tubman became the head of a local group of scouts. scouts. She learned the Gullah language of the local people there and she earned the trust of their locals who showed them many of their pathways and many of their herbal remedies. And she developed a relationship with them that would be helpful later on in her career. And this is a picture of black troops occupying Jacksonville during the Civil War. And respected for her knowledge, as I mentioned, of uh, Roots and herbs, Tubman was sent to Amelia Island, Fernandina Beach, that's actually where some New Hampshire troops are, to help with a large dysentery outbreak. And that's pretty much all we know. We don't know exactly when she was there, who was there with her. That's all the knowledge that we have. There along with Union troops, they had some plantation raids along the St. Mary's River to flee more ens enslaved. With her intelligence operation under the direction of Secretary of War, Edward Stanton, Tubman also relayed information to Brigadier General Rufus Saxton about Jacksonville. Jacksonville was a refuge for white Unionists and Blacks seeking freedom and was also considered a strategic stronghold in Florida. The Union had occupied it twice, but they had to retreat both times. And Tubman's intelligence network gathered information on the on Jacksonville in 1863, creating an opportunity for another assault on Jacksonville. In Jacksonville, the first South Carolina garrisoned the city, constructing forts Higginson and Montgomery around the railroad terminal. Now, Colonel Montgomery and the second South Carolina, with Tubman on board, continued upriver to free and recruit enslaved and engaged the Confederates. On their return down river to Jacksonville, they were told that their units were being recalled from Florida to assist with attack on Charleston. 
So you can see that's the start of her not just nursing or having a laundry house, which is another thing she did, or not just cooking. She's going to do so much more. And I'm going to tell you about this raid. I'm going to move myself a little bit here. The Combahee or Combahee River Raid of June 1863. And I got to be honest, I know a little bit about the Civil War, but I had never heard of this. During the weeks and months prior, her network of spies collected valuable information from the plantations along the river. Information would help Tubman and Army officials in planning a joint operation to liberate the enslaved along the river and to disrupt enemy activity in the area. In the rice fields between Beaufort and Colton counties along the river, hundreds of Africans, Americans continue to toil under the watch of their enslavers. Tubman's plan to free elements of the third Rhode Island have um, free people, enslaved people in the river area involved the participation of the second South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, a regiment comprised of mostly freed black men from the seas islands along South Carolina, Georgia and Florida coast. The second South Carolina's commander, Colonel James Montgomery worked with Tubman to execute her plan which was to be carried out in secrecy. On the evening of June 1st, Tubman directed three steamships from St. Elena Sound up the Combahee River and reached a destination in the early morning hours of June 2nd. Under the protection of the second South Carolina and with Confederate troops retreating from the area, enslaved people ran from the surrounding plantations towards these ships. And that plays a big role because she had developed a relationship also with the river pilots. As they sounded their whistles, notes which personified the sound of freedom. Thanks to the intelligence collected by Tubman, <clears throat> excuse me, and by the way, she was there, more than 750 men, women, and children were liberated. And the U.S. troops destroyed several million dollars worth of plantations, warehouses, and rice fields along the River, including the vicinity of the Combahee Ferry. As one journalist later noted, Tubman, along with the Black soldiers of 2nd South Carolina, struck terror to the heart of the rebellion. Now, the other colonel I mentioned, Higginson, did not like these guerrilla tactics, um, but T Tubman was willing to use them with limited means, and Montgomery was in willing to use them to the extreme. And those who sought freedom along the river joined Harriet on the return to the U.S. lines of Beaufort on June 3rd. Here, the work of Tubman continued as she recruited additional troops from the population of freed men, many of whom joined the 2nd uh, South Carolina Volunteer Infantry. I actually think they got about 100 more men. This single action on the Combahee River solidified her status as the only African-American woman to lead troops in a military operation during the Civil War. And that is courtesy of the National Park Service. And this picture, I think, was only um, discovered of her. I don't have any of her in uniform or even not in uniform, but during the war. But this is one of her in somewhere in her 40s that was found. Uh, most of the pictures of her are when she's quite elderly. So this was a treasure that was found, and I believe it's owned by the Smithsonian, and it might be in the Museum of African American History. And here's a sign about the River Raid. On June 1st to 2nd, 1863, a federal force consisting of elements of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, an African American Union, and the 3rd Rhode Island Artillery conducted a raid up the Confederate-held Colbahee River, Colonel James Montgomery led the expedition. Harriet Tubman, already famous for her work with the Underground Railroad, accompanied Montgomery on the raid. She definitely went into battle then. And that's a picture from Harper's Weekly. Um, the raid of the Second South Carolina Volunteers, Colonel Montgomery, they should have mentioned Tubman as well, along the rice plantations of the Combahee. So you get a little idea of what was going on here. Think about how many enslaved were freed on that day. And here was something I had never learned before or heard before. 
Uh, many of you are familiar with the movie Glory, uh, which is a fictionalized account, but I mean, a pretty d darn good portrayal of my um, estimation about what happened to the 54th, 54th Massachusetts, along with many other troops there at Fort Wagner. But Harriet Tubman was first introduced to the 54th Massachusetts in June or July of 1863. After that river raid, she was no longer working in that spy network. And unfortunately, what was a more traditional role for women, not unfortunate that she was there helping, but I do believe she was uh, quite the, the soldier. Um, and she served meals to the men of the regiment. And I'll talk about this more later including Robert Gouldshaw's last meal. Now, Robert Gouldshaw was interesting because on June 3rd, uh, he had a different relationship with Montgomery. Remember, Harriet and he worked hand in hand, Montgomery and Harriet. But Shaw, and I'm just mentioning this just to con contrast, had different ideas of what constituted acceptable warfare. And the reactions to Montgomery's orders reflected that difference. Whereas Tedman ha had led the raid up the river, Shaw felt troubled when he received similar orders a week later. He and the 54th accompanied Montgomery on his raid up the Altamahara River on Ju June 10th and 8th, 11th, 1863. I'm sorry, I messed up the pronunciation. And they reached Darien, Georgia, a small, staunchly Confederate town. Montgomery command, commandeered one of the fifty, the comp, one company of the fifty fourth Massachusetts, and ordered him to assist in sacking and burning the town. And I'm sure he was not. Um, there's very different views on what you do to civilians, and some people think that that's acceptable because it's war, and you, this will speed up the timeline. Other people think it's barbaric behavior and should never be tolerated. But this is what Shaw writes. Um, but realize this was much more extreme than what happened with Harriet. In fact, I don't even think she agrees with um, this. Uh, my own distaste, besides my own distaste for this barbarous sort of warfare, I'm not sure that it will not very much harm the reputation of black troops and of those connected with them. For myself, I've gone through the war so far without dishonor, and I do not like to degenerate into a plunderer and robber. And the Northern press soon, conf soon confirms Shaw's fears as even the abolitionist newspaper, the Commonwealth condemned the burning of it and talked about Yankee Negro vandals. And, and it praised, while it praised Tubman's river raid, it was conducted entirely different. The instruct, she did not destroy an entire town and they believed that it crossed her a line. And by and so just think about that contrast. And then Robert Gould Shaw is going to be going to his death along with many of the troops from the 54th Massachusetts, 7th New Hampshire, and so many other regiments there. And this is what Tubman, who witnessed this battle, I never knew this before until I was doing this research, describing it. And I thank uh, the National Park Service for this information described it to historian Albert Bush Newhall Hart. And then we saw the lightning and that was the guns. And then we heard the thunder and that was the big guns. And then we heard the rain falling and that was the drops of blood falling. And when we came in to get the crops, it was dead men that we read, very symbolic. And that is from the book, Harriet Tubman, The Road to Field, um, Freedom by Catherine Clinton. And after the battle, the survivors, well, they counted devastating, awful numbers of casualties. It was not a successful endeavor at all. The wounded went to se segregated hospitals. So Clara Barton worked, and I'm sure you're fam familiar with her, founder of the Red Cross. She also served during the war. And she greeted the white officers when they arrived at Hilton Head, while the black rank and file returned to Beaufort. And they were under the care of Harriet Tubman. And Harriet's uh, experiences with the 54th Massachusetts and the Civil War as a whole influenced her for a long time. She research, she struggled to research, receive recognition and compensation from the U.S. government for her wartime service. 
Her pension application in 1897 claimed three years services as a nurse and a cook in hospitals and as a commander of several men, eight or nine as scouts during the late war of the rebellion. And I'll talk about that more later, but she never gets quite what she was supposed to be receiving because she was a woman and she was a black woman. And so that women were not thought of as warriors during that time. And they certainly un did not consider a black woman, unfortunately, um, it's absolutely awful to be a leader of men. Harriet Tubman used for two more years, she worked for caring for the Union forces, caring for newly freed people, scouting in Confederate territory. So she did more scouting and nursing wounded soldiers in Virginia, which continued for several months after Lee's gender. In April of 1865, she received little money for a military service, and you will discover that much of her life was lived in poor poverty. She served others. She, it was always a struggle, always a struggle for money. After the war, she raised funds to help newly freed people, including, and, and she also joined the suffrage movement, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony and their fight for women's suffrage. And she cared for her pay, aging parents and worked with a woman, a white writer, Sarah Bradford, on her biography or autobiography as a potential source of income. Now, one thing I neglected to mention was when her husband wouldn't go with her, he was a free black and she wasn't. When she goes back to get him at one point, she discovers that he has moved on and married somebody else, even though he was already married to her, which was pretty um, unbelievable when she was leading all those people to freedom. And she was going to take him with her. So many years later, she married a Union soldier, Nelson Davis, who was also born enslaved, was part of the U.S. Colored Troops. Um, and she also cares for elderly in her home. And for some years, she lives in Canada until it's safe to return to the U.S. when the fugitive slave law is no longer in effect. And after that extensive, and she lived, had moved to Auburn, New York, where she uh, cared for her, the elderly. And she also adopted a daughter named Gertie. And she also campaigns for that military pension, which she certainly deserved. She was finally awarded $8 per month after her husband passed away in 1888 as his widow. She got $8 for that. Then eventually she got another $12 in 1899 for her services as a nurse. But she should have actually, like it was typically $25 if you were a spy and a scout, which certainly has been recognized by many other people but not by the government at that time. And that is a picture of her in her later years. And this is a picture of her with her family before her husband passed. So that on the far left, that's Harriet, sitting down with a cigar in her mouth is her husband, her second husband, and standing up next to her behind her husband is her daughter, Gertie, that they adopted. And this one, uh, a few years ago, a movie came out about her called Harriet. Um, and it was about Harriet Tubman. And PBS also has a few videos on Harriet Tubman. There's a lot more information out there now. And this is from um, a part of the USA Network. And um, some family members of Harriet Tubman, um, relatives, uh, not direct descendants, but through the, Tub um, through the family line. And this person a few years ago in 2019, A.J. Bricker II holds a sword with an ivory handle that belonged to his late relative, Harriet Tubman. The Brickler family rented an entire movie fam theater for them and their friends to watch the release of Harriet, a movie depicting her life. Tubman carried a pistol during rescue op missions, telling her charges to go on or die, for a dead fugitive could tell no tales. And she wasn't joking around. She valued all life. And um, someone I know very dear to me told me that this would be a single shot ball and cap and it would be a very powerful weapon. So that movie came out in 2019. You can find it 
I would encourage you to watch it. Um, there is some fictionalized parts, several characters that are created, but the spirit of the movie, I think, is true to Harriet Tubman. And also P PBS has a number of episodes about her and her work. I don't think they've received the recognition they deserve. The Underground Railroad work was amazing, but the work that she did in the Civil War and the work she did as a spy and a scout, all the things that she did should be recognized today. It's happening more and more, but there's still much more to be told. Um, and this is uh, something from a newspaper and I talked to you she about her relationship with Robert Gould Shaw and the, she um, attended the memorial, the dedication for the 54th Massachusetts Regiment Memorial. And the Globe reported that Tubman was the central figure at the memorial It continued. And it, as it, she said, as she gave, stood and gazed on the useful features and that's in Boston, Massachusetts, you can go see it. Uh, it had been damaged, but it has been returned of Shaw in the 54th Massachusetts. And she turned and said to those near to her, that looks like him, Shaw, the last morning I saw him. He was killed that night. That morning I gave him his last breakfast. This is the first time I've seen the monument so close, close to. I was here when they unveiled it, but the crowd was so big. So I went back to Auburn, but I made up my mind to see him again sometime again and that's articles from the boston globe and the boston herald and also from the uh, national park service and the boston herald reported that tubman stood at the memorial bent with the weight of years and gazed longly and tenderly on the magnificent work of the sculptor and dropped a silent tear for the departed dead and while at the ceremony Herman also had the chance to renew her acquaintance with the boys of the 54th that she had worked alongside during the war. And I never knew that she gave him his last breakfast. I've never seen that uh, information before. Um, but I also want to point out that they make her, I mean, and she was an elderly woman at this point and perhaps frail, but let me remind you that she also was a spy, a scout, and may I say also a warrior. And I know there's something up there in the chat that I will get to shortly. And Tubman purchased their first piece of land in Auburn, New York, when they can return from Senator William Seward. He was a senator. He was a um, secretary. Uh, he was in the government business. And she spent the rest of her life there. She had a wooden house that burned down and a brick home. And by the way, she is always struggling, always struggling financially. In 1898, she underwent brain surgery to relieve the pain in her head that did not allow her to sleep. And this is she refused anesthesia and she bit on a bullet. I mean, I just thought that was something, those stories that weren't true, but she had seen soldiers doing it during the Civil War because she had constant pain from that injury. And in 1903, she donated a piece of her land to the American, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Zion Church in Auburn. And then eventually she gave a piece of land so that the Harriet Tubman Home for the Aged opened there in 1908. By 1911, she was so frail, and this is her then, that she was admitted into the home named in her honor. And a New York newspaper described her as ill and penniless, prompting supporters to give a new round of donations. Surrounded by friends and family members, she died of pneumonia on March 10th, 1913, just before she died, she quoted from the Gospel of John to those in the room, I go away to prepare a place for you. And Tubman was buried with semi-military honors, other places I read full military honors, but apparently there was some, it was related to the military in somewhere in um, Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn. There's her grave. I think that was bought years later. There's also another stone that I didn't show that was put up in tribute to Harriet Tubman. And here she's listed as Harriet Tubman Davis after marriage to her second husband. And this is a statue, a statue that's traveling the country, right? And it has been, and it's from um, Wesley Wolford Sculpture Studio, LLC. And she's leading a child of freedom. Um, it did travel the country, and it, I don't know if it still is. It was a little controversial, and it was uh, made by a, not a Black um, sculptor. But it does show Harriet Tubman in her role. 
And there are numerous sculptures on of her in different places. Let me look at the chat for a minute. The movie infos. Oh, yes. IMD streaming on MaxGo, Cinemax, App, uh, Amazon, Direct TV, renting on Vudu, Apple TV, and Amazon Prime. Thank you for sharing that, Joyce. Uh, it's a good, and, and you can go to PBS and watch the uh, other things, the PBS, but the movie, it, it looks very cool. And I would urge you, I hope the word gets out about her. This came out just a little ways before the pandemic. So I felt like it got lost a little bit. Oh, thank you, Maxine. She said, great info. I just didn't think it deserved the attention it should have, but the lead actress, she was nominated for an Academy Award for that. So let's continue. I just, I used a lot of sources there. She's featured in a couple of books, but it's not, they're not just focused on her. The Agitators by Dorothy Wickedon. Um, people that were, you know, strongly fighting. And the Better Angels, which talks about women during the Civil War and then Bound for the Promised Land. And lots of sites that talk about newspapers, magazines, online, and there's so much incorrect information. And there'll be more coming out. So I sort through it and try to find the most accurate information for you. Uh, Thursday, it will end up being online and you can watch it on YouTube. As always, it is a pleasure to have you join me and thank you for following us. The Step Into History Digital Edition talks about the Chautauqua movement and their relation to Mina Miller Edison. That's by Tim on February 7th at 1030. And then the history of Fort Jefferson and the Dry Tortugas. There's all kinds of connections to that. I hope you'll join me um, and you'll find out about the history of that. I have not been there yet. And Dan said, many thanks, Holly. I had no idea the extent of her Civil War work. You want, to be, want me to be honest here? Um, I didn't either. And I thank you for joining me for that. All right. I will see you next month. Thank you so much. And if you ever have any questions or suggestions, email me here. I try to get it as smooth as possible. Sometimes I don't reach that goal. But I thank you for uh, tuning in. And as we all learn more about history, you can also learn from history and um, present a more accurate view of history. Thank you. I'll see you next month.